The old Gardner Pingree house loomed before us, its brick walls darkened by years of weathering and untold stories. My friends and I had decided to visit Salem, driven by a mix of curiosity and the thrill of stepping into one of America's most haunted towns. The air was thick with the smell of salt and decay, the Atlantic Ocean a stone's throw away, lending a dampness to everything around us. But nothing was as suffocating as the house itself, the house where Captain Joseph White met his grisly end. Are you sure this is a good idea? Sandra, the most superstitious of the group, asked as we stood in front of the mansion. Her voice quivered as she took in the house's eerie silhouette against the dimming sky. Don't be a baby, Mark teased, though his usual bravado seemed forced. Even he couldn't hide the unease that had settled over us like a wet blanket. Giovanni Alabiso, our tour guide, had told us all about the house's history as we roamed the streets of Salem earlier that day. His voice had dropped to a conspiratorial whisper when we reached the topic of Captain White's murder, recounting the night of blood and betrayal. The Knapp brothers had enlisted the help of Richard Crowninshield, and together they hatched a plan to kill the elderly merchant for his fortune. Crowninshield crept into the house one night, ascended the grand staircase, and crushed the old man's skull while he lay in his bed, oblivious to the horror that awaited him. People say his spirit never left, Giovanni had said, his eyes glinting with something akin to excitement. Captain White still roams the halls, guarding whatever treasure he might have left behind. We all laughed it off then, nervously, as tourists often do when confronted with tales of the supernatural. But now, standing before the house, as the last traces of daylight bled from the sky, the laughter seemed far away, drowned out by the quiet hum of fear in our veins. The door creaked as it opened, as if on cue, though we had not touched it. Sandra yelped, and I felt my heart skip a beat. Mark pushed the door open wider, his bravado returning, though I could tell it was a front. Come on, let's get this over with, he said, stepping inside. The air inside was musty, thick with the scent of old wood and something else, something that made my skin crawl. We all shuffled inside, the door creaking closed behind us, the sound echoing through the silent house. The hall was dimly lit by a few weak bulbs, casting long, wavering shadows that made the hair on the back of my neck stand on end. It's just an old house, and I muttered to myself, though the words did little to calm my nerves. The floorboards groaned beneath our feet as we moved further inside, each step loud in the oppressive silence. The house was deceptively large, with corridors branching off in several directions. Portraits of grim-faced men and women lined the walls, their eyes seeming to follow us as we walked by. I tried to ignore them, but the feeling of being watched was impossible to shake. We reached the staircase, the same one Crown and Shield had climbed on that fateful night. It was wide with a polished wooden banister that glistened in the dim light. Sandra hung back, her eyes wide with fear, but the rest of us were drawn toward it, as if something was pulling us in. Let's check upstairs, Mark suggested, though there was a tremor in his voice that hadn't been there before. We started up the stairs, the creaking of the old wood, the only sound in the house. My heart pounded in my chest, each step feeling heavier than the last. When we reached the landing, we paused, as if the air itself had grown thicker. This is where it happened, I whispered, more to myself than to the others. Sandra had stayed behind on the ground floor, but I could hear her pacing nervously in the hall. Mark and Jessica exchanged uneasy glances. The door to Captain White's bedroom was slightly ajar, revealing a sliver of darkness beyond. I felt a chill run down my spine as we approached it. Mark pushed the door open, and we stepped into the room. The air was colder here, and the smell of old blood and decay was stronger. The room was sparse with only a bed, a chest of drawers, and a small desk by the window. But it was the bed that held our attention, the spot where the captain had drawn his last breath. Suddenly, the door slammed shut behind us. Sandra screamed from downstairs, and we all turned, panic rising in our throats. Mark rushed to the door, trying to yank it open, but it wouldn't budge. Help me, he shouted, and Jessica and I joined him, pulling with all our strength, but the door remained firmly shut. The temperature in the room dropped sharply, and I could see my breath forming small clouds in the air. A low guttural sound filled the room, like the rumbling of distant thunder, but it was coming from the walls, 
from the floor, from all around us. And then we saw him. At first, it was just a shadow on the wall, but it grew darker, more defined. The figure of an old man, with a twisted face of rage and pain, emerged from the darkness. His eyes, hollow and black, stared at us with a hatred so intense it felt like it could burn through our souls. Captain Joseph White, he moved toward us, not walking, but gliding, his feet not touching the ground. We backed away, terror freezing our limbs, but there was nowhere to go. The door was sealed shut, and the windows were too high to reach. What do you want? I managed to choke out, though my voice was barely a whisper. The captain didn't speak, but his expression said it all. Revenge. He was protecting something, and we were intruders, trespassers in his final resting place. The figure raised a ghostly arm, and I felt a pressure on my chest, as if an invisible hand was squeezing the life out of me. I gasped for breath, the room spinning around me, my vision darkening. And then, as suddenly as it had started, it stopped. The pressure lifted, and the captain's figure dissolved into the shadows. The door creaked open, and the cold air rushed out of the room, leaving us gasping and trembling in its wake. We didn't wait to find out what would happen next. We bolted for the stairs, nearly knocking Sandra over as we fled the house. The front door flew open as we approached, and we burst outside into the cool night air, our hearts pounding in our chests. But as we stood there, panning and trying to collect ourselves, I glanced back at the house and saw something that made my blood run cold. In the window of the captain's room, where we had just been, was a shadowy figure, watching us with those same hollow black eyes. We had escaped, but we were far from free. We stood there gasping for breath, our feet rooted to the spot as the realization sank in. We had escaped the house, but the shadowy figure in the window, Captain Joseph White, was still watching us, his hollow eyes burning with a malevolent hunger. We need to get out of here, Mark said, his voice trembling with panic. Now! But even as he spoke, the wind picked up, howling through the trees and sending a shiver down my spine. The air around us grew heavy, almost suffocating, as if the atmosphere itself was pressing down on us. I could feel something was wrong, something far worse than what we had just experienced inside the house. It was as if the entire town was holding its breath, waiting for something to happen. We can't just leave, Sandra whispered, her voice barely audible over the wind. What if he follows us? Mark opened his mouth to argue, but the words died on his lips as a low, mournful wail echoed through the night. It wasn't coming from the house. It was coming from all around us, reverberating through the empty streets of Salem. The sound was filled with anguish, with rage, and it clawed at our sanity, unraveling the thin thread of courage we had left. We have to go, Jessica urged, grabbing my arm and pulling me away from the house. We can't stay here. We started to run, our footsteps pounding against the pavement as we fled down the deserted street. The wail followed us, on growing louder and more frantic, as if the very town itself was crying out in terror. I glanced over my shoulder, half expecting to see Captain White's ghost chasing after us, but the street was empty, save for the oppressive shadows that seemed to grow darker with each passing moment. We didn't stop running until we reached the town square, where the old witch trial memorial stood like silent sentinels in the night. Panting and drenched in sweat, we collapsed onto a bench, our hearts racing as we tried to catch our breath. But the wail persisted, a constant reminder that something unnatural had been awakened in that house. What? What the hell was that? Mark stammered, his face pale and slick with sweat. Did we... Did we do something to piss him off? I don't know, I replied my voice shaking, but it feels like we've unleashed something, something we shouldn't have. Sandra was trembling, her hands clasped together as if in prayer. We should have never gone in there, she whispered, tears streaming down her cheeks. We should have listened to the warnings. As if on cue, the wail suddenly stopped, plunging the town into an eerie silence. The stillness was more terrifying than the noise, as if the very world was holding its breath. And then from the shadows came a voice, a raspy, guttural whisper that sent a bolt of fear through my heart. You cannot leave. The words seemed to come from everywhere and nowhere, surrounding us, pressing in on us. We all froze, 
our eyes wide with terror. The voice was unmistakable. It was Captain Joseph White. You cannot leave until I am avenged. The words were followed by a sudden gust of wind that whipped around us, icy and relentless. The temperature plummeted and I could see my breath in the air, thick and misty. The wind howled around us, but it was not a natural sound. It was filled with voices, whispering, chanting, their words unintelligible but filled with malice. Mark stood up, his fist clenched. We have to go back, he said, his voice determined but edged with fear. We have to end this. Are you insane? Jessica snapped, her eyes wide with panic. Going back there is suicide. If we don't, I said, swallowing hard, he'll never let us go. The truth of it hung in the air, undeniable and terrifying. The captain's spirit had latched on to us, and there was only one way to break free. We had to confront whatever it was that held him here, trapped in the place of his brutal murder. With a sense of dread settling over us, we turned back toward the Gardner Pingree house. The streets were deserted, the windows of the old colonial buildings dark and lifeless. The town itself seemed to recoil from us, as if it knew what we were about to do. As we approached the house, the shadows seemed to shift and writhe, alive with a malevolent energy. The front door stood wide open, inviting us into its dark maw. My heart hammered in my chest, every instinct screaming at me to turn back, to run as far away as possible. But we had no choice. We had to face whatever horror awaited us inside. We stepped into the house and the door slammed shut behind us, sealing us in with the darkness. The cold was immediate, biting into our skin, and the air was thick with the smell of decay. The house was alive with sound, creaks and groans, as if the very walls were closing in on us. Where do we start? Sandra asked, her voice barely above a whisper. The bedroom, Mark said, his voice firm despite the fear in his eyes. That's where he died. That's where we need to go. We moved as a group, sticking close together as we ascended the stairs, the creaking wood beneath our feet, a constant reminder of where we were. The house seemed to pulse with a dark energy, each step heavier than the last. The walls around us whispered, and I could feel cold breath on the back of my neck, as if something was standing right behind me. We reached the bedroom door and a wave of nausea hit me. The door was ajar, just as it had been when we first entered. I pushed it open, and the sight that greeted us was worse than anything I could have imagined. The room was transformed, no longer the sparse, cold chamber we had seen earlier. The bed was soaked in blood, the sheets twisted and torn as if they had been caught in a violent struggle. And there, at the foot of the bed, stood Captain Joseph White. His face was a mask of rage, his eyes blazing with a cold fire that chilled me to the bone. You took everything from me, he hissed, his voice filled with a hatred so intense it made my skin crawl. You will suffer as I have suffered. Before we could react, the room exploded into chaos. The walls shook and the floor buckled beneath us. Objects flew through the air, smashing against the walls. The temperature plummeted further and I felt a cold hand grip my throat, cutting off my air. I struggled, gasping for breath, but the grip only tightened. Mark was thrown across the room, slamming into the wall with a sickening thud. Jessica screamed, but her voice was cut off as an invisible force lifted her off the ground and hurled her into the dresser. Sandra dropped to her knees, clutching her head as if trying to block out the sounds, the pain. Make it stop, I managed to choke out, the pressure on my throat unbearable. But Captain White only smiled, a twisted, malevolent grin. Not until you give me what I want. What do you want? Mark gasped, struggling to his feet, blood streaming from a gash on his forehead. The captain's eyes burned with fury. Justice, he spat. Revenge. In that moment, I realized what we had to do. We had to find a way to put his spirit to rest, to give him the justice he had been denied in life. But how could we do that when we were fighting for our own lives? With the last of my strength, I reached out and grabbed the small chest on the desk, the one we had ignored earlier. My fingers fumbled with the latch, and the lid sprang open, revealing a collection of old yellowed papers. Captain White's will. This is it, I gasped, holding up the papers. This is what you want, isn't it? The chaos in the room halted abruptly, as if time itself had stopped. Captain White's gaze locked onto the papers, 
And for a moment, his expression softened. But it was only for a moment. Burn them, he demanded, his voice echoing with the weight of centuries of anger and pain. Burn them and release me. With trembling hands, I reached for the candle on the dresser. The flame flickered as I held the papers over it, and then they caught fire, the flames devouring the brittle parchment. As the will burned, a scream unlike any I had ever heard filled the room, a scream of pure, unadulterated agony. The air around us seemed to crackle with energy, and then, just as suddenly as it had begun, it was over. The room fell silent, the cold lifted, and the oppressive darkness receded. Captain Joseph White was gone, his spirit finally at peace. We stood there, shaken and bruised, staring at the ashes of the will. The house, once so terrifying, now felt empty. Just an old building with a dark history. But the memory of what we had seen, what we had endured, would haunt us forever. As we left the Gardner Pingree house, the first light of dawn breaking over the horizon, I knew one thing for certain. Captain Joseph White's story was finally over, but the scars he left on us would never fade. We had survived, but we would never be the same.